Hey everybody, I am Tin Tim, that is T-I-N as in not guilty, T-I-M as in make your case. I am America's first drag queen public intellectual, aka the Cornell motherfucking West of drag, coming to you each week with my thoughts on the most recent episode of RuPaul's Drag Race Season 5. I'm coming to you this week from my hotel room in sunny Boulder, Colorado. I'm here to speak on a panel and read from my writing. So this week I wanted to talk some more about Roxy Andrews and Jinx Monsoon and Roxy's behavior this week. People might just feel like it was just her acting out, acting out of her insecurities, etc. I think there's probably some truth to that, but I also think that there's value in thinking about what she was trying to say to Jinx and at least giving her the benefit of the doubt enough to sort of take it seriously, especially when it comes to this whole idea of her feeling like comedy drag or camp drag is somehow insulting or disparaging what she knows is drag, right? Or that what is being made fun of in the comedy is drag itself. So you could have a whole bunch of conversations about how comedy is part of drag's history and it's not disrespectful. It, I think what I'm interested in is, is like understanding what that thing is about drag as this, you know, the version of drag that Roxy does that is all about perfection and polish and poise and elegance. What is it about that that is so meaningful to her and how do you value that without disparaging this other thing? And, you know, I've already talked in previous videos about how I don't think that it's as simple as a dichotomy between two types of drag. There's all kinds of drag. You know, even putting that aside for a second, one of the things that this had me thinking about was what feels like the racialization of different kinds of drag. And I don't mean that it's like all people of color do this or all white people do this kind of drag because it's much more complex than that. But I do think that, especially on that camp and kind of freak end of the spectrum, I think the dominant image of that is whiter. Or what we see, who's most visible to us, there's a whiteness to that. And by the same token, I think that it seems to me like maybe there's a particular meaning and value of a certain sort of perfection and poise and elegance for some drag queens of color, obviously not all. With both camp and transgressive types of drag, there is this thing sometimes of embracing being really almost deliberately ugly or at least finding beauty in a garish look, embracing the grotesque. And I feel like it makes sense to me in a way that as a person of color in this culture where, you know, across our history, folks have been seen as always already grotesque all the time and sort of held up as these examples of something that could never be elegant, never be sort of normal, always abnormal, always an abomination, that creating a type of drag where you celebrate being, you know, grotesque may not, you know, appeal to some people and that it makes sense to me that for some people accessing that elegance and perfection is liberatory in its own way, which I totally respect, right? At the same time, I think there are, have been, a lot of, you know, Know, eccentric and transgressive drag queens of color. You think of people like Vaginal Davis, right? And I think not just in drag, but in like pop culture in general, sometimes eccentric, avant-garde, experimental, risky, whatever it is, artists of color are especially invisible. That moment when Lady Gaga was first becoming really popular and around the same time, both Grace Jones and M.I.A. came out with statements sort of accusing her of kind of jacking their stees a little bit or doing things that were similar to what they had done but getting a lot more attention at a mass level for it, right? Obviously Grace Jones, for instance, is legendary but more of a cult figure than a kind of a mainstream pop star like Gaga. And so I think the other piece of it is that, you know, is there a way that white privilege functions to make the gross and the experimental that something that seems more palatable to the masses or if not palatable, more transgressive somehow because, you know, you get more like mileage out of it or something. You know, it's kind of like the, the Buffy paradox, right? Like on Buffy the Vampire Slayer, on one hand, the most progressive thing about the show was that it was this beautiful, blonde person who would usually be a victim in horror movies kicking ass. But at the same time, the least progressive thing about the show was that it was another blonde, beautiful protagonist, which is easy for people to swallow. And, you know, would a Butch Dyke, black woman fighting vampires, you know, get a show, right? So that's something that I'm wondering about and thinking about. Riffing on the Roxy thing, but obviously going way beyond it. You know, I think that 
for those of us who were really put off by Roxy's comments, I do think there's value in thinking about why transgressive drag or camp drag might not have meaning for some people or for some communities or some individuals, and to try and understand that, and also understand what value they do draw from perfection and beauty in that very pageant type of way. That's kind of all I have to talk about this week. I need one really important thing from all of you, especially those of you who tune in every week and are regular viewers, in order to prepare for next week's video, which is a special surprise. I am going to create on Facebook an album of all of my looks from this past season. I will leave a link to the Facebook album down below in the description. Click on it, go to the Facebook album, and vote for your favorite look by liking it. Try to only like one or two if you can, like limit yourself. Obviously I can't stop you from liking all of them and you will see what I have in store for you next week. That is all, much love to you all, mwah.